It's our second uh, In Conversation of the Year, and I'm delighted today to uh, welcome two exceptional um, artists and curators. Um, Renda Missir is a curator and a gallerist located in Beirut, and Zen Dauk is an architect and ceramicist also located in Beirut. Zain and Renda, thank you so much for, um, for welcoming us. I know that it's, it's late for you. It must be, what, 8 p.m. or something like that. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you have welcomed us in your studio and in your gallery. Thank you so very much. Uh, Renda, I'm looking forward to seeing you at Collect next week. Um, it's, a big, uh, it's a big step. It's going to be your first one. So let me uh, start maybe with um, a quick introduction of each one of you, and then um, maybe you can take us more in detail of your incredible um, uh, biography. Renda, you are uh, an interior decorator. You work with your husband who has um, an architectural and interior design firm. And through working with him, you discovered that collecting craft was one of your passion. And you thought that it was a good idea to share that passion with the public. You launched your gallery and you are starting now to go to international fair. You represent Lebanese artists, but not just Lebanese artists. You are creating a real cosmopolitan gallery of local talent and international talents and mixing cultures and styles. You specialize in uh, ceramic and glass, I understand. Is that, am I right so far, on the right track so far? Yes, but I'm not an interior designer. I just oh. work with my husband. You work with- I'm well, a business and marketing. Uh, I had business and marketing degree. But, but I'm, I sure, always I'm sure that you, I'm sure that you- You have a great eye. eye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Zane. <laughs> um, Zen Dauk, you are an architect and you come from a, a family of uh, architects. I think that there are a few of you in the, uh, in the family. And ceramics has always been your, your special place where you go when you need to resource yourself. And it was a hobby for many, many years. And uh, in the past couple of years, you have decided to make it your main activity. Um, probably because of the circumstances, and um, it's what we call making lemonade out of lemons. You have a... Um, I, I believe it's a path, and the path led me to focus. I'm not sure it's, it's the circumstances. Just believe in a path. Sorry. <laughs> I had to put that in. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a lot more positive. <laughs> more positive than... <laughs> forward looking than, uh, than I had put it. Yes. Um, so yeah. before we start, I just wanted to give a little, um, uh, as I said, 29 second background on the history of Lebanon, because the theme today is yes, to uh, understand your practice, but it's also to understand how one keeps a creative, joyful, passionate practice in the environment in which you live and you have been living in the country um, is at the moment. So I did a quick Wikipedia on Lebanon and I only did their last hundred years. And in the last 100, 120 years, um, there has been two World War Wars, okay? Um, two Ottomans, uh, there was a famine, there was a French mandate, there was refugees influx um, just constantly, six civil wars, a revolution. You've had the civil war of your neighbors that spilled over in your country, and you had the explosion in Beirut a year ago. Um, it's a lot for a very small country that has a culture of um, uh, origins and mixes and um, influences from everywhere. It's a true, it's a true melting pot. And how does a, a small country like that keeps the resilience and the joy um, is, is really uh, incredible. 
So Renda, why don't we start uh, with you? You really, you told me when I, uh, I spoke to you, when we were preparing for this, you told me um, Lebanese people are resilient, strong, and joyful. So tell me a little bit about that and how that translates into what you do and how you share that passion and that joy through your gallery. Uh, as you said, we are a resilient uh, people. We are, uh, I don't think anybody would have uh, gone through what happened with us if we were not Lebanese people. We are loving, we take care of each other. Uh, it's simple. Yeah. This is how we are. This is how we, 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 are, we are born. This is uh, our culture to stay in our country to, uh, as I told you before, the gallery was because I'm just in front of uh, the port where the explosion happened and the, the, the gallery and everything was totally destroyed and uh, myself severely hurt, but this didn't stop us to rebuild directly. Uh, during the, the agony, we were rebuilding the houses, the offices, the gallery, all the, people, the pieces that were broken. We bought other new, we didn't think one second just to close up and leave the country. So this is just only, it's not only me, this is uh, all the Lebanese people, they did the same. Mm -hmm. I'm part of an NGO as well. Uh, I think the NGOs did the work that the government should have done. We, we helped all the people, all, we, uh, we restored all the houses. We were there for everybody. We gave food to the poor people. It's, it's just in our genes. Right. So, I mean, that, that strength and that resilience, I think, is, um, is going to be quite obvious in the pieces that you are showing. And if we could do a little tour, maybe, of your gallery now, and uh, if you could show us um, the, uh, the pieces, because I was struck by the strength of the pieces you were showing us. So tell us a little bit about what we're looking at now, who the artists are and why you chose these pieces. These pieces are the soliflor. So it's for flowers, where you can put just one flower. These are two different uh, international artists. One of them, the one with the soliflor is Fosto Salvi, who will be exhibiting with me in Collect. Actually, I don't have pieces of collect here. I'm keeping them as a surprise. The other one is an uh, English artist. His name is Stephen Edwards. This is my glass artist. This is Alexa Lexfeld. She's a German. She shows, she's, she's very good in lighting. She puts so many colors in one piece. It reflects on the, on the light. This is a Lebanese artist who will be also exhibiting with me. Her name is Suraya Haddad, but not this piece, something new for collect. Another Lebanese, Andrea, Suraya again. Actually, so after the explosion, I only wanted to have colors. This is another English artist, and this is a Chinese. So I went and I was like, I don't want to see any black new piece. I went in all colors which was something new for me because I usually go with uh, classic colors. But this time I wanted really to have some colorful uh, thinking maybe, to be surrounded by beautiful things. Here we have a mix of Lebanese, of Danish and the Japanese artist. Again, the glass. It's quite, uh, it's quite abstract forms, and it's it's quite. There's a mix of highly polished and um, quite rugged and and um, and raw pieces. Is that um, a reflection of a bit of the, uh, the 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 contrast in which you live, or am I reading too much in it into it? It's uh, you know the house when you want to put uh, some. Uh, some pieces in your house, they cannot all be rough and ceramic. You need some transparency, you need some light. This is why I always think that you need to mix the glass and ceramic. 
but it doesn't the only thing that i felt is that i will need to reflect some colors some joy for the lebanese who will come to see this gallery to see something new uh, something i didn't used to have to see color for life right and um I, I think am I right in thinking that your uh, your husband is French? Yeah. So how does how does that French influence? Because France has a long history of colonization um, of of Lebanon, uh, unfortunately, but the cultures are quite close to uh, to each other. How does that French influence, um, or if it does, come into your into your work? Actually, his mother is Lebanese. Oh, okay. And as we say in in Lebanon, we only we always follow the mother. <laughs> so he's more Lebanese than French. We only have the name French. Now his father is French, but uh, they they always live here. His his father was uh, passing by for one year in Lebanon, and he met his mother, and they, and then they stayed here. Right. So we we'll, we live between here and France because of this as well. But it doesn't reflect much. Right. Okay. I prefer but, to stay 100% for them. Right. So, but what is interesting is that when we look at the pieces that you're showing, um, I don't think that we could say, um, I don't see, for example, um, a strong, um, what, we, what we would term as Middle Eastern aesthetic or, or Arabic aesthetic. It's very, international, contemporary, you know, um, you could transpose your gallery in New York and just at looking at your pieces, we wouldn't know that you are a Lebanese curator. This may be because uh, other than being a Lebanese curator, we are, uh, my husband and myself already, uh, see? Collectors, sorry, we are already collectors. We've been doing this for for many years, and it's by being a collectors of art paintings that we that I found myself in ceramics because I uh, I used to buy some ceramics for our project, my husband's project, in which I uh, I help a lot, and we do the turnkey uh, project, which means we need to have the full. The, we, we do deliver the project in full from mm -hmm. toilet papers to bed linen to ceramics to everything. So when they go in their house, it's a fully uh, turnkey project. Mm -hmm. And uh, by being a collector and uh, doing all the fairs in the world, Basel, Miami, Basel, Geneva, collectible, collect. I used to go to collect as well. Uh, all in France and in, uh, in Germany, uh, I fell in love with the ceramic, and it's uh, like the I, I I thought of opening this uh, gallery and show what I like to the to the Lebanese people. Mm -hmm. All the Lebanese people are are all over the world. Yes, it's a very big diaspora. Um, in terms of working with um, a local artist, and, and you represent uh, Zayn, and you're going to be showing her work at, uh, at Collect next week. So before we go to Zayn, with the other artists, what is your relationship with them? Do you, um, do you, are you a mentor to them, or um, do you just buy or, or represent what they uh, create? Um, what is the what is the relationship with them? We have a lot of uh, very good Lebanese ceramic artists. We don't have uh, glass, unfortunately, but we do have a lot, a lot of ceramic. Uh, like Zain said, I have an eye, and it was very difficult to convince Zain to work at the beginning. When I went to <laughs> see her uh, work. She was thinking I was just coming here to say hello and meet her. And when I saw her pieces, I really, really fell in love. I said, I will do anything to have them with me. And this is, it's, and uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's also, you need to feel 
the work. What I like is what I have. There's a lot of good Lebanese artists, but maybe the, their work doesn't match with what I, I want to represent. Right. So it's first, first of all, I, I have to like the pieces and uh, it's very important to me to get to know the person I'm working with and to be on the same level of thinking. Mm -hmm. And after that, I will leave them all to work at their pace. Uh, what they like to do, I don't like to interfere, but I just give my opinion, by the colors, and the, in which way, which, which pieces I like more, on which I would like to emphasize. But at the end, each one is better to do his own work by himself. Right. No, absolutely. I, I agree. So you, you said that uh, Zane was uh, a difficult, a difficult catch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a good segue. Because she didn't, she didn't want to sell. <laughs> ah. <laughs> that's a problem for an artist. <laughs> She wants to keep all the pieces for herself. Convince me. She's very good. <laughs> <laughs> so Zain, uh, let's uh, let's turn to you now. Um, and oh, you know, oh, here we go. Sorry, I thought I had lost you for a second. I'm going to have to excuse me uh, just okay. one moment because my AirPods have disappeared. Oh, I'm going to have to shift to regular. That's okay. Just one minute. Sorry. That's all right. No problem. I uh, hope, hope that works because there's a thingy. Yeah, I'll hold it. <laughs> yeah, I can, uh, I can hear you well. Um, yeah. So you told me that, yes, you are Lebanese, but first you're Beriti and then you are a Lebanese. So tell me a little bit no. more what that means. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go back. <laughs> I'm actually one of these people that believes that I am Lebanese before that I am Beiruti. Okay. But definitely there is, uh, there is a very big influence uh, from Beirut because I come from Beirut and because my family, um, my, because of our interest in architecture and in, in, uh, in, in art and in, in building, you know, architecture, it, 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 it ingrains you in a, in a, in a it's very concrete. Uh, I mean, to, no pun intended. Uh, um, so it really ingrains you in, in, the, in, in the buildings that, that are there. And we have a lot of, my great grandfather was a great builder and built and purchased many old buildings. Um, so that's, I think my attachment as well, you know, to my roots and, uh, and to the beauty of Lebanese architecture. Yes, I mean, and if we can have maybe a little look at your uh, studio, which is uh, in a family home, you used to live there and it's a- Yes, it's a, it was my family. family. And we're gonna see all these details uh, of the yes. beautiful architecture of- I shall uh, show you. That would be great, thank you. Yeah. You let's wanna do it now? Part. Yes, let's do that. But before we do that, I, I'd like to say a few words about Randa because she was quite, uh, she didn't actually, she does mentor us, at least she does mentor me, and she does uh, definitely, it's, it's a give and take relationship, and of course I was difficult, but you know, had she not been, um, had she not spoken so passionately uh, about what she does, and had she not shown me uh, how much she believed in my work, um, I wouldn't, you know, she was the first person to make me do this, and she was very persistent. And I have a lot to thank her for that. And uh, I needed to say that <laughs> because she, she, was, uh, she didn't say that. <laughs> so can I ask you so, a question to both of you before we go there? Would you yeah. say that the, uh, the, the women in Lebanese culture, where, where, do they, where do they fit? I mean, is it, um, is it a fake patriarchal society where women in the background are really running the show or... Uh, is it uh, is it um, a, a sharing of equals or how, how is we are the women yeah. in, in society? I guess that depends also on the social structure. Definitely, um, we are very lucky to be, you know, um, I mean, legally, it's a problem. We are not emancipated legally. OK, we, we follow we follow religious law, which is not it, very patriotic. But, patriarchal 
Um, however, you know, education is definitely empowering. And I do believe that the women of my, of my country are hard workers. Um, I believe women of the world are hard workers. We may have in this region um, a harder time, uh, you know, getting our dues, but I know that every woman I know is a very hard worker. So, you know, it depends on the social structure. Right. Renda, what are your, uh, what are your views? I think that uh, everybody thinks that being uh, Lebanese, maybe they associate, associate us to Arab world where the man is, uh, has the power. I think it's uh, not in Beirut. The woman is behind every successful man. Right. Ah, that's interesting. We do a lot here. We do a lot. The, the we woman work. here. We do a lot. We have the house to take care. We have the kids. We have our work. We have our social life, which is very, very hectic. And we have to be all the time up to the level in doing everything. So it's above our our capacity and we manage to do everything perfectly. We multitask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the Lebanese women are multitask. We've been through such such difficult times that we learned a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, okay, Sasha, thank you. Let's do a tour of, the, uh, of, your, uh, of your studio and, and okay. your Okay, hang on, I just have to now take myself and switch my camera yes one moment now how do i switch that there okay <laughs> so i will start this is my office i'm going to stand here this is my office which was my office when it was my home so not much has changed i do a lot of work here um, a lot of my pieces are exhibited here a lot of my thought process goes here. A lot of my ideas go here. So there's a little idea stand. There are my models. Um, some, you know, another series that I'm working on. And there's a view on my garden. So my desk is right in front of my garden. These are some pieces from the Third Kingdom. And as I said, it's an old Lebanese house. So I have the old tiles that are super beautiful, terrazzo, the beautiful glass stained windows. And if you look up, the beautiful cornices. Mm. So it's a very high ceiling. This is my stock of work. <laughs> <laughs> this is my kiln room, which used to be my daughter's bedroom. And these are some pieces that I'm working on currently. And then where the magic happens, my studio. So it's small. And this is a piece I'm working on for Renda, so she doesn't shout at me. <laughs> and these are my wheels. What, uh, you work in, in porcelain, you work in clay, what do you work in? Uh, so I'm gonna shift you back. Let me just shift you back to me. There, and go back to my office. So I work in different uh, mediums. I believe that every piece, I, I love all mediums. I love stoneware, I love porcelain, um, I love raku. But I do believe that each series and each piece requires um, a certain clay, a different kind of clay. And sometimes I use clays that are not supposed to, you know, that do not fit um, um, the, traditional, um, the traditional way of working with, with that medium. Uh, and I push the limits of that, that, that medium because I, I, I really like to work on the edge of things. And, and maybe it's my architectural background and my structural knowledge. I, I, I believe that I build, my pieces are built. They're never, they're never sort of, oh, sorry, hang on. I'm just trying to fix you there. Uh, 
um, they're, they're never really, um, there's a lot of structure involved. I can see my architectural background in every piece that I create. Right. So, um, so I work in the, I mean, there are several types of clay. Right. So um, there, there was a, there's a comment um, in the chat box saying everything is so clean. And I have to say that I have never seen a studio. And by now, I have seen a few. I have never seen a studio as tidy and as clean and organized as yours. <laughs> um, I am obsessive compulsive. I, I like to work. <laughs> so, yes, it's not the first time I've heard this comment. I am very organized. Right. Uh, I believe in uh, I believe in order, and and the freedom that comes from order. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a greedy designer, and I always believe that there's so much in my mind. There are so many things happening. There are so many ideas. There are so many things that I have to think of. That if I don't have order, then I cannot function, and I cannot to life all the ideas that I want to bring to life. Um, so yes, I am very organized, extremely so. <laughs> so let's pull, uh, um, pull back now a little bit. And um, you, you came to ceramics um, when I think you became a mom and you needed yeah. to have time to yourself. Can yes. you take us through that journey from, from that moment to, to now? Yes, absolutely. I just, I just need to fix this because my arm is like going down. Hang on. If I do this, does it work? Uh, yes, it's perfect. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'm going to do that. Um, so my daughter was born, um, was born prematurely um, 23 years ago. Um, and, you know, as a first time mom, I uh, was nervous and the baby was very small. She was so tiny um, that I... You know, and it was a planned pregnancy, so I wanted to do everything well, and I am an organized person, so schedules and lists were all there, uh, which gave me a lot of anxiety in a sense. So I, um, my husband, who's a great gentleman, looked at me and said, you know, I had gone from a hardworking architect to focusing on this little thing. <laughs> Um, and I became obsessive. And he said, you know, you really need um, to find an outlet for yourself and find some time for yourself uh, because you're going to explode. And I said, okay, um, I will go um, and take ceramics again because I love ceramics from ever since I was a child. I believe that it's, it's one of the most versatile mediums. And the, the medium that I was, um, there was a relationship, a rapport with this medium from the first time I touched clay. Um, so I went to ceramics class and every Saturday, like clockwork, I would go for four hours and I poured myself into that medium. And I was learning the wheel and the wheel is extremely meditative. meditative. It's, it's, it's just a moment where you, you complete everything, it shuts off and there's just a spinning wheel. Um, and I loved it. And I never, it, it became my companion in life. And that's what I, I've always had it in my life. And, and it was my hobby for many, many years because I was an architect and, um, and architecture took up, you know, it was my profession, it took up my time. And I love architecture. So that's why I, I don't see myself as a ceramicist really. I am today an architect, a builder, a builder with clay. Okay, because I approach everything as an architect, you know, architecture school, that's what it does to you. Right. You know, I've seen it, I've seen it happen to my daughter, who's also an architect, my husband, who's also an architect. So, um, so um, slowly but surely, I always invested uh, a moment of my week into ceramics. I never took it further and I never wanted to attach a monetary component to it because I believed it was my meditation. It was what brought me uh, peace. And if it became a, a job, then I would lose that. Until I think, until Randa. <laughs> 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 I 
Till Renda popped into my life. <laughs> and she sat me down and, you know, she said, no, no, you should, uh, no, you should consider this differently. And slowly but surely, you know, um, as I said, it's a path. Slowly but surely, the path took me there. There were so many things that, that took me towards focusing uh, on ceramics. And it was definitely my series, The Third Kingdom, um, that happened right after the explosion, that had started before, that took me through the revolution, that became um, my companion, these pieces, every one of them. I created a dominion, I created a world. And, and these pieces became my companions. I healed why them, you, I brought them to life, they healed me. Why did you need to create a world? Well, in essence, I'm a storyteller. I love stories. I'm a very curious person. Um, I'm a person that loves, um, I'm also an Aquarian, like you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just believe that, that the world is huge and there is so much happening and it's always interesting to learn. It's, it's, um, it's always interesting to learn and to share. I, I love telling stories. And I love telling stories with clay and having people enter a world that will take them away from their daily life just for a moment, you know, experience something different, a different point of view, a different uh, color experience. I am a lover of art. I love the expressionist era. I love the emotive colors. Um, I love that, um, you know, just taking someone into a world. Right. So... You create this world, and and this world has its origin kind of underground? Absolutely. <laughs> underground is just really, we haven't gone there yet. We should go there. <laughs> Actually, I, said, I had a mantelpiece in my home in the mountains that I felt it was a very rugged piece of wood. And, you know, I was sitting there watching television and I thought, you know, I need to put something on there. And I didn't know what to put. And then, you know, I said, I thought to myself, yes, I'm going to sprout mushrooms. So I made little sculptures of mushrooms. Um, and from there, I, you know, as all curious people do, I started investigating different shapes of mushrooms and different colors of mushrooms. And I fell onto this world of, of magic and mystery and it just took me you know it completely took me and I saw how um, the most and it came at a time when we were we were experiencing a huge revolution um, the country was in complete upheaval our families were in upheaval uh, we had problems with the banks we had problems with 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 supplies we had problems with people we had you know it was huge and, and, and this, this world, the world of fungus, lives and, and thrives on symbiotic relationships. So in a way, I, I kept thinking, you know, but look at them, they do it well, let's learn from them, you know? And that's what grabbed me, I think. So, so you see, you're always at a moment in your life where something will take you, something will grab you, and it's because of what happens around you. It's, you cannot remove yourself from where you are and create a world. And, but it doesn't have to be a world that is exactly like the world you're in. Like you were saying that maybe we don't have the Arab or the Lebanese, if you want aesthetic, but definitely there is a, a Lebanese thought process. There's a Lebanese feeling, there's a Lebanese passion because, you know, um, and I also believe that you are, I mean, you, you did enumerate a whole bunch of problems that we've had, but I do believe that we are more creative for it. We are people that, when you live through turmoil, you have to express yourself. And, you know, our language is one of the most expressive languages, whether it is for good or for bad. You know, we speak, we have terms of endearment that go, you know, beyond terms of endearment. And we have swear words that go beyond swear words it's we're we're passionate people um so so i believe you're more creative in times of turmoil um so obviously i used to call the third kingdom my 
I used to call my studio creative escapism, when in fact it wasn't really creative escapism, it was creative reactionary, you know, I was reacting in my own way, in my own world, maybe the way I knew how. Right. And, and that um, uh, network and symbiosis and that sense of community is very much something that is at the core of your family and how you live in the city and in the country um, and, and have done for a generation. You have you are Absolutely. a family. And, and Renda um, was uh, alluded to it too. I mean, everybody helps everybody. Um, it's, it's another um, uh, representation of Lebanese culture. Yes, we are very much, uh, we share, and I know, let's say, um, nobody's ever left on their own here. It is a bit of a village and it can be, it can be overpowering sometimes, but you know that you will never fall and not be picked up. Never. You know, right. we are sisters and brothers and united beyond anything, even though sometimes we are warring, you know, but humanly we are united. Right. But you spend your life fighting with each other. Well, not us, really. I think <laughs> I, I think our our government is I think they suck. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's uh, let's have a look at some of these pieces of uh, of your third kingdom. I think you have some examples. Yes, I'll here. show you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's well, actually, let me give you a little a little introduction. So, so the third kingdom is a is a realm of of um, of the kingdom of fungus and fungus. I I believe it's a third kingdom. So we have the kingdom of flora and the kingdom of fauna. And, and I don't believe that fungus falls within neither flora nor fauna. And it, in fact, creates symbiotic relationships with flora and with fauna for both to thrive and survive. And the biosphere would not have existed without, you know, the, without um, the kingdom of fungus. And it is through these symbiotic relationships. They were the first colonizers of the earth in about four billion years, sorry, a billion and a half year, years ago. Um, a, a, a symbiotic relationship was created between algae and, um, and fungus uh, for the algae to come out of the water and to be able to colonize the earth and become flora, bacteria, you know, started feeding off of flora and, you know, fauna came about and that's how the biosphere happened. Um, and it's obviously a very slow process, but I think that, that the third kingdom, my third kingdom, um, came about at that moment in time. So there's, there's that moment when, where fungi and, 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 and algae meet, and there's the emotive colors of expressionism, of algae, of fungi, um, that have come up in, in my world, okay? But I had to obsessive compulsive, I had to create an order. So as I created these pieces, I would, you know, I would look at them and every one of them would come about at a moment where I was either thinking about something, being generous about something, you know, being curious about something. And I realized that they were actually an order. So I have an order of maybe nine shapes of mushrooms and maybe 12 colors. So they are all named according to shape, color and size. So let's say I'm gonna show you, let me take you um, here, hang on. Sorry, it takes me time. Yes, so let's say this one, this one is a polypore. It's a polyporous canaria magna. So magna is the size, it's is on the larger side. It, it's around 40 centimeters in, in width and maybe 30 centimeters in height. It has, you know, three heads, and therefore I find that it is a very curious mushroom. The poculum um, is a very generous mushroom. You know, it's giving and open. Um, there's the tubaria, another poculum, a calvasia that is a very nurturing mushroom. So this is the calvasia. It has a very motherly kind of feel to it. These are my these are my samples. You know, Randa keeps wanting to take them. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so this one is a royal mushroom. It's it's a boletus, and I you know I call them that. They 
you know, there is a boletus, but the boletus doesn't really look like that. It's more like a lycopor, like a pardon, if, if you want to really be realistic. But, you know, I just created this world like this one. This is a cantharellus, a cantharellus canaria mini. And the cantharellus is a very sexy mushroom. I mean, look at it, you know, it's just out there. <laughs> this is a caprinus. A caprinus is a very intelligent mushroom. So this is my world, really. I, I really wanted for them to have personalities. I felt that they had personalities. You know, they, they spoke to me differently. Every one of them spoke to me differently. Um, and from there, I moved on to, um, um, uh, because I'm a designer, because I'm an architect by trade, you know, my work, it, it's, it's like this moment that meets between form and function and, and you know, and, and biomorphic forms and stories. Um, so I wanted to create design elements and that's where the shining shiitake came out and um, their beautiful uh, lighting fittings um, that, uh, that I've been working on for a while now. And it's another series. I always work in concept. For me, the concept of the story it matters, you know. I also have the, you know, the screaming headlights that came out during the revolution with these open mouths that sprout light beautifully and they are screaming. I think all my pieces tell stories. Mm -hmm. um, one of our uh, guests in the audience who was, who's also an artist was commenting saying, um, artists are storytellers really, that's-, that's Yes, what they are, we, I do yeah. agree. Absolutely. When, when you share your story with um, uh, the Lebanese public, do they understand it? Do they relate to it? Do they, how do they react yes. to your art? Well, well, the Lebanese, I have to say that the Lebanese people are lovers of beauty and they're lovers of tales. Whether it's um, a child or someone that is not versed in the arts or someone that is not, you know, of a certain social standing, uh, or a certain social, you know, whatever background. Um, I believe that my stories, they transcend all of this. My pieces speak to everyone differently. And I've noticed that every time, you know, a person chooses a piece to purchase, um, uh, uh, it, their personality comes, because I see myself as a polypore. Uh, you know, I, and, and I see Randa as a Corollius. A Corollius is one of these, you know, it's one of these beautiful mushrooms that goes all over the place. That's what Randa is. She's, you know, she's adventurous. Randa will go out there, you know? She's so proactive. And I think, you know, this, I think we feed off of each other. We are very symbiotic, you know? We work together as a group. Um, so, I lost my, tr my train of thought there. <laughs> uh, no, uh, we were talking about how, how the Lebanese public reacts to, uh, so, to your so story. So definitely, yeah. I see that each person that, that um, uh, sees one of these pieces and chooses it, I see their personality in it. I've had many people that are very generous, you know, just fall in love with poculums because they are open. Um, and I did have an exhibit, and, and you and I were talking about that. Um, uh, oh, I saw that comment. Randa's my friend. <laughs> she knows me. <laughs> That's how she fell upon it. <laughs> uh, it's a village. We all know each other. Um, so I had an exhibit, and I do believe you and I were talking about this, and I was saying, you were to ask me, me how my work had come across in these times, you know? Mm -hmm. And I had said, you know, they... It was difficult for me to answer that question. And then you so graciously put me on a path and said, you know, if, if you give a moment to a, a, a five block radius of people around you, you have actually given back to your community. And I think that these pieces had so much healing power. I think they healed me. And there is some kind of energy. I do believe in energy and I do believe in symbiotic relationships. I believe that, that as I was healing and as they were healing me, something came into these pieces. And when I exhibited them and I knew how I wanted to exhibit them, I knew how they should be because they talk to each other and they, they're loud and they're proud and they give off a beautiful energy. And I put them in a central hall all together and they gave a moment of happiness. 
And I believe that that there that was the reaction that my pieces gave. It, it makes people happy. They make people happy. You know, Randa told them it was just me and her. And, and she's that's the first thing she said, you know, Zane, they're happy and they're talkative and they're interesting. Um, and I think I think that's what it did. And mm. I think whoever sees them sees that. It will be I very hope so. Yeah, I hope so too. I certainly have the impression. <laughs> Renda, when we uh, when you show it next week, it will be very interesting uh, to see how uh, the the London public is going to receive them because it's it's a very very unique um, uh, message for a start and and design. And um, is is your hope to bring the uh, the Lebanese joy and um, fighting spirit and and community spirit um, uh, to to London during Collect through Zane's pieces? Yes, definitely. The, there is one thing I I always want to. I, I I'm just uh, I'm a little bit like uh, Zane. Look, okay, then she's doing her pieces by her proper hand. But all the pieces that uh, I want to sell, I really don't like to sell them if I don't know where they are going and if they are not in a house or in an interior that does fit. It's not only selling. The purpose is not only of selling the pieces. I would really like at the beginning I didn't sell any piece if I wasn't the one who take the piece and deliver it to the place where it should be and if it doesn't suit the place I won't sell it this when I started and then when I opened the gallery it was sometimes like uh, can I see the photo where are you going to put the piece because really if it doesn't match or if I don't feel that the piece deserves this place I don't want to sell it so mm -hmm. I hope that in London, the pieces, I, I actually, I don't have a very, very big booth. I would have loved to take more uh, from, uh, from my designers and more designers to show, uh, to show more of our uh, artists. But uh, I had to cut it short and have uh, less pieces. And I really want these pieces to be in interiors that really reflects what Zane and other artists would love to have. Mm -hmm. so it's not only a question of selling. Yeah, it's a question of- We are trying our best. We, we, we choose the color to, be, uh, to give this impression in the interiors also, especially in London. Yeah. She invests herself totally. I have to, you know, I have to intervene and say she's, she does really, it's a passion for Randa. It's not, it's not a business. She's very passionate about what she does. She's very passionate in how she does it. And she's, uh, she, she's innate in her. She's maybe not an interior designer, but she's, it's innate. She, she understands the subtleties. Which is possibly even better because then she's not confined by the structure of the, uh, uh, of the profession. Of the trade. Of the